friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Because that's what you're here for, right? Put your ear holes to the test and hopefully you'll get the best, the best storytelling around at least once a month. You know, when I have time. Trying my best here. But uh, sometimes time slips away from you. Sometimes, especially when you're living in a far corner of the world and the days bleed into each other. It's all like a dream. Often a bad dream. And I think that's what this story is about. You see, normally I try to dig back into my past to give perspective on my present and hope for the future. But this is something that happened recently that I want to talk about. It's another freestyle story here on Buddha and the Slut, and I think if I have called it this, you'll see it on the nameplate or the uh, titling of the podcast. It's, I don't like you. And you're probably wondering, what does that mean? Are you talking about yourself, Brooke? And no, I'm not, though it sometimes is applicable because we're all critical of ourselves deep down. That's what it's about, right? Life, learning to love thyself, know thyself. As the Temple of Delphi says, know thyself. And I had this opportunity to learn a bit more about myself the other night. You see, let's get right into it. I was sitting at a local watering hole. I don't go out often, but once in a while I get a few hours to go and sit with my expat friends here on the little isle of Koh Yao Noi. Yes, I just gave away the location. That's where I'm at these days. Koh Yao Noi in southern Thailand in the Andaman Sea between Krabi and Phuket. And I'm sitting at a table and I'm chatting with a couple of folks that I know. And, um, you know, watching some people play pool and seeing a little stage in the corner where maybe once every few weeks I will go up and uh, sing a couple of ditties, let out some juice, let out some energy, let the crowd have a good time while also being able to vent some emotion. You see, it can be very tough in Thailand or in Asian culture in general because showing too much emotion is considered a faux pas, a major one. It's considered a, a weakness in character. And for me, I'm kind of like the exact opposite. In the last decade or so, I've been trying to approach this whole vulnerability and authenticity thing and be more truly myself. And I guess that, that Mediterranean blood is not hiding itself the more and more I try to dig because the passions come out. It can be, come out as beautiful feelings and wonderful feelings, which people like want to embrace and surf as I give them waves of joy and excitement and uh, revelry and passion. But they don't want to see any of the, quote, negative emotions. People are not that comfortable with anger or sadness, especially from men these days. And I get it. I definitely get it. But it is a cultural thing because if you're, you know, if you're in Southern Greece or if you're in Italy or in parts of Eastern Europe or hell, New York City, and you get mad or you get sad, that's okay. That's part of being human. But here, not so much. And that also seems to apply to the people who come here and stay here for a long time. You see it on the expat faces sitting in the bars quietly, drinking themselves slowly, waiting for death. And I met a lot of those guys, mostly guys, some of them ladies. And usually I have decent conversations with them. I get perspective on what needs to happen in life to avoid that particular pitfall or what parts of myself are being reflected in this person. Now on this particular night, as I'm sitting there chatting with a couple of 30 somethings and they're telling me about their lives, one's a media executive, one works with animals. They're both interesting people. This fellow who I had seen more than once at this particular location over the last few months, shaved head, glasses, a mix of like Thai and tribal and Buddhist and mantra tattoos, wearing a tank top, wearing the shorts, he's late 40s, early 50s, his piercing eyes, uh, kind of like wiry, bony, sharp edged person. But I had said hello before, I had shaken his hand, Uh, you know, the basic pleasantries were exchanged, didn't think much of it. I tried to give everyone their due and give them a chance. And this fellow suddenly came over and he sat down across from me at this table as I'm just, you know, rounding out some sort of anecdote or story to these two other folks. And he looks at me and says, Brooke, um, I feel compelled to say something to you. And I'm like, okay, well, okay, I'm not gonna use his real name. Uh, for the sake of this story, we'll say Judgy McJudgerson. Judge Reinhold, that's a nod to the old Clerks cartoon. Okay, we'll just call him Judge, right? Does that work? Judge, sitting across from me, looks me in the eye, unbreaking gaze, making that kind of effort that a, quote, deeply spiritual person tries to make when they're making a point, especially when it's about to make you uncomfortable because they need to impose it upon you. Brooke, I just, uh, I'm here because, well, there's no way to really put this gently. I 
I, I said, okay, judge, just say what you got to say. I'm ready for it. And I'm in a pretty good space. I haven't been for a few weeks. It's been a rough ride and I've had some personal stuff happen, but it seems like you're here with good intentions. So go ahead, shoot me in the face with it. And he's like, all right. I came over because I have this strong feeling that I don't like you. And I need to come to grips with that and understand it and maybe share that with you so it can be resolved. And I sat there kind of silently for a moment, the cross of a smirk on my face, meeting this bubbling up of old feelings of anger, the immediate urge to suddenly become defensive or to cross my arms in front of my chest and block the energy or to sit back and square my jaw to his and give him a more piercing stare to go, listen, you're not going to make me buckle in front of these other friends of mine. How dare you chop me down like this? Oh, you think there's something wrong with me? Let me tell you what's wrong with you, mister. I was already like arranging my attack. I was already going into Terminator Robocop mode as I stared at him. I was already like listing all of his weaknesses because I could see them presented in front of me like a heads up display for Metroid. But no, I'm not the same person I was five years ago, 10 years ago, not even like two years ago. A lot has changed for me. And I thought, okay, here I am. If I'm trying to find the bit of the Buddhist path to get through life, if I'm on the downslide, you know, the second half or the last third of my life, the most important thing I can do is learn about myself. And you get that through the reflections of others. I believe that we're all walking through the hall of mirrors and, you know, here's a guy who is some aspect of me that I need to either embrace or observe or reject, but I need to actually experience it first to learn something from it. So, okay, reflection of Brooke. Okay, judge, tell me why you don't like me. So he proceeded to go into a slow and drawn out and he would punctuate it with pregnant pauses. This perception that he had seen me for a while coming into the place and he's like, I just, I don't think I've ever met someone who clearly carries their pain in a way that they want to share it with others. You go up on stage and you sing and you growl into the microphone and the last time you were stomping your foot on stage with the rhythm of the song and it cleared out the entire place. Everyone left and you just were totally oblivious that you made them uncomfortable and you were so desperate to be seen and it just really bothered me. And I look at my friend beside me and the other one across from me and they were kind of like, we're not going to get into this because, Brooke, we sense that you could get really angry. And I immediately put up my hand to both of them as they were responding in an uncomfortable way, like, oh, maybe we should defend Brooke. I'm like, no, no, guys, it's okay. It's totally okay. So, judge, this is your perception of me and the perception of events that I'm coming in trying to be seen and then to make people uncomfortable. That's what you think I'm about. He goes, yes, it's clear that you have all this pain and don't you understand that that pain comes from one of two forces, one of two ways of reacting to the world, and it's clear you've chosen one path. And I said, let me guess, Donnie Darko, you're going to tell me that life is about love or fear and nothing in between, and that I'm purely reacting from fear. Is that it? He goes, well, uh, isn't it obvious? And maybe I can find a way to help you not walk that path anymore. I'm like, well, I see your point. And in fact, you're probably right on some counts that Every two or three weeks when some emotional stuff is built up for me, especially in this last period where some very personal and very challenging things, some circles of hell I would not wish upon my worst enemy have occurred, I need to find a way to express that and get that out. Because as the Buddhists say, these moods move through you, across you, over you, within you like weather, right? Like clouds, like storms, like sunny days. You can't hold on to them and you can't push them away faster. You have to let them travel through. And maybe someone like me is more predisposed to being sensitive and feeling negative emotions in public because I'm overwhelmed by the feelings of other people around me and what I'm experiencing, and I need to release it. I release it sometimes through my writing and creations, but often it doesn't feel visceral enough for me. Other times I make sure to go to the gym five or six days a week. The problem within this last month has been I threw up my back badly doing that. I'm old now. I pretended I was 20. I'm pushing 50 and throwing 40 high hard kicks at a heavy bag in a Muay Thai gym resulted in two hours later, me bending down to pick something up and feeling like someone slid a pair of scissors through my lower spine and cut all those tendons and nerves. I was crawling to the bathroom that night. It was excruciating. So if it was a hernia or a slip disc or similar, I couldn't bring myself to the gym for at least a month, probably more like six to eight weeks. So here I am, judge, 
with all this internal stuff happening in my personal life. And you're only seeing a slice once every two or three weeks of me coming into this watering hole. And you're seeing the energy I'm entering in with. Yes, you're right. Was I stalking around the stage like a panther? Sure. Yes. Right? That I stepped onto the stage and made sure to do my angriest songs or growling or stomping or making it all a big amount of theatrics? Yeah, absolutely. But was I doing it to get attention? Hmm. Maybe on some level, and see what's interesting about that is the only thing I'm going to refute you on is the fact that I cleared out the place with my bad vibes. Actually, no, the old German guy who does seven songs and is totally oblivious to the fact that he's always off key. He's the guy who sang right before me and cleared everyone out. And then when I stepped on stage, people came back. If you remember correctly, on that specific night where I was stomping, they all gathered in a semicircle around the stage as I did my song Shadowland and then, then did a version of Dennis Leary's Asshole, an improv for 15 minutes, and people applauded and bought me four beers. And I remember you sitting there and staring at me and then turning away from it. So it bothered you. It bothered you that I expressed myself in this way. Well, I, I, I just don't know why you need to live with this anger and carry it around. And I'm like, oh, not to quote Zach De La Rocha from Rage Against the Machine, but sometimes your anger can be your gift. All right. You're saying that life is just love and light and that you used to be angry and you need to choose this path of love and light now. Guess what? I don't see the universe that way. The universe was violent in its birth by every possible conception of the thing. It was not a gentle creation of creation. It was violent. When we are born, we are birthed screaming and bloody into this place with shit and blood and, and a mother being torn apart, bringing new life into this world. And again, with Eastern thought, since you seem to be totally tattooed with it, Judge, across your body with all these symbols, Eastern thought will say, that life is a long string of suffering with little pearls of joy along it. And I had been going through an extended period of suffering and I knew that the only way for me to get escape velocity from that, the only way to get my rockets to fire fast enough to escape the gravity of what I was feeling, this swirling cesspool, this black hole of despair and dread that was slowly pulling me in and sucking me down like a tar pit magnet trap, I had to get it out of me. And I did. And I did in the only way that I knew how. And so what's fascinating to me is that your perception of me that night, and maybe the few nights before you had seen me saying where, oh, he's an attention whore and he's trying to make people uncomfortable with his shit. Do you see me when I'm alone in my bungalow, sucking my thumb and weeping to deal with my stuff or working on my projects or meditating to stay calm or trying to exercise and work out this horrible injury that I'm experiencing right now? Do you see me smiling and waving to the locals as I zip around the island? Do you see me having gentle conversations with my friends or Skypes with family and whatever back home? Do you see me when I'm you know, helping the elderly in the neighborhood or guiding expats to the best place to stay or meeting up with old friends who've come to the island? Do you see me bartering and haggling with the locals and trying to make sure they have a wonderful time as I act out my description of what I want and use my limited knowledge of Thai? Do you see me in any of these other situations? No, you see the tiniest slice of who I am and you have risen to judge me. And this is what's interesting because normally I would go into fiery levels of defense and that defense would actually be an offensive defense. And like I said, I stared this guy down and before he even told me, I knew he had a bad divorce. I knew that he was cut off from his family. I knew that he had been living for years in cheap places like Southeast Asia or South America, that he was definitely one of those tribal burning man types who would try to change his life after living a straight laced arrow job and that he had done a whole bunch of psychedelic drugs since I could tell by the wavering of his eyes and the way his pupils were expanding and contracting in the same light. And it turns out I was right on every count. He's like, well, I, the path I found to releasing all the anger that I used to feel uh, was ayahuasca. I'm like, guess what, brother? You should go to listen to my podcast, episode eight, Vine of the Dead. Yeah, been there six times. He goes, well, I've, I've done it about 200 times. And let me tell you, I've really been able to deal with my anger. I'm like, you know, Anyone who clings to anything that much maybe isn't actually dealing with their anger. And maybe the reason that I bothered you so much is because my behavior in those moments on stage of releasing that rage, was there maybe a part of you that saw a reflection of yourself? Because I look into your eyes right now, my friend, and I see that your jaw, your teeth are gnashing and you are holding down and holding back this dark tidal wave of stuff inside. 
and you're pretending you're fine, but maybe you're running. Now, of course, I could be wrong, okay? I could be wrong. You might be totally fine and well-adjusted. You might be walking the path that you need to walk, but as the Hindus said so beautifully and wisely, there are many paths up the mountain and they all lead up the mountain. And isn't it a bit egotistical to think that one way is the only way and that way is yours? And he sat for a moment and he lowered his head and he raised it back to me and he's like, yep, there might be something there. I might be getting a distant past echo of how I used to be and I see it in you and I just don't want you to walk the same path. And I'm like, well, I, I appreciate that. But let's be honest here, Judge. You didn't come over here to help me and make me better. You came over here because you were feeling discomfort and you needed to get it out of yourself so you could feel better. Is that even partially correct? And he just stared at me. And so I smiled, lovingly as I could, staring right back at him, locked gaze. Buddy, that's what I was doing on stage. Okay? Absolutely. Was it selfish? Yes. Did the attention it garnered help me feel some sort of connection to all this stuff that I couldn't release one-on-one -on -one because most people think I'm too intense when it comes to those personal relationships if I share any of the negative stuff? If I weep and gnash my teeth, if I scream and yell and punch walls, people are uncomfortable. They're terrified. They're overwhelmed by it. It's too much. Let me share something with you that I've shared with other friends throughout my life, Judge. I have started to feel akin to a Ferrari that is forced to drive around in second or third gear. You forget you can even go any faster. Or how about this? How about an Arabian thoroughbred? who instead of racing in and winning the Preakness is instead bought by a farmer yoked up and plows a goddamn field. That horse is gonna forget what it is. That car is gonna forget what it's truly capable of. It's like that cautionary fable about the baby elephant tied up with chains and a stake in the ground around its leg. And it pulls and pulls and pulls and it can't break free. And years later, the circus owner replaces that chain with a rope, even though the elephant is full grown and his staff worry, well, won't it break free? And he's like, no, no, it, all it knows is being there. So it's not even going to try. And that's the sad truth of it. The elephant forgets its strength, forgets what it's capable of because it's been in this prison for so long. I've been called a lot of things in my life, but there are two poles that really encompass the things that I've been struggling with that are usually imposed upon me by other people. Brooke, you are not enough, or Brooke, you are too much. Now, the self-worth issue of the not enough is something I'm probably going to struggle with till the end of time. It is one of the things that does bring out some anger in me, and that anger and that sadness wells up, and then I use it as fuel to remind myself every day if I can, if I am vigilant enough, that I am enough. Enough of a human being, enough of a spirit, enough of a mind, enough of a man. Good enough, strong enough loved enough in myself but the too much man i finally come to grips with the fact that too much is your bullshit and i'm saying this right now to judge and every other potential judge and every other past present and future judge if you can't handle my heat get the fuck out of my kitchen you can't just come here as that old chestnut goes, if you can't handle me on my worst day, then you, you don't deserve me on my best. That's true. If you come just to drink at the fountain of my effervescence, to watch me wax poetic and metaphysical, to see me primp and preen and feel like the waves of warm intensity and beauty and sexual attraction, whatever else that comes off of me, the, the wit and the wisdom, if that's all you want and you don't want anything else, then we are never going to be close and I'm going to cut you off from that food supply or that narcotic that you're looking for faster than you can say, holy shit, I was wrong. If you want to be close to someone, if you want real capital C connection, if you want true intimacy, you need to be ready and grounded and strong enough to, as they say, hold space and allow that person across from you to be themselves fully. Good bad, and everything in between, angel, demon, human, and more, all of it. So if my anger is too much for you because it brings up your shit, whatever mommy and daddy did to you, whatever wifey or husband did to you, whatever your sister or brother or teacher or priest who molested you did to you, 
If my anger reminds you of that, or if my sadness is a mirror for your own fears and weakness and vulnerability, if that makes you uncomfortable, then that's something you need to look at in yourself. Now, I promise I'll give you this much, not just all of you, but I mean to judge specifically. You had the balls to come up and say something. I respect that because rarely do people anymore walk up, sit down and say, this is how I feel. Thank you for giving me that much respect. But next time, before you do, try to remember that universal truth. If someone is stirring up something in you, it's not about them. It's a mirror for your own shadow shit that hasn't come up yet and is young warned so crucially in his work. As Carl Jung said, if you repress your shadow and your darkness for too long, if you push down your primal instincts and urges and needs, if you stay away from the things that make you uncomfortable and try to pretend everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine, let's just smile and do the tie way. If you do that too long, first stage, you get warnings in dreams, usually nightmares. Second stage, you start to draw people to you that are reflections of this shadow self. We start to create conflicts and traps for you and force you to deal with this stuff that you've been repressing. And then the third and final stage is your health. That illness itself will come upon you when you push down your anger and sadness and quote negative emotions for too long. I think it's safe to say we all know someone with cancer who's pretty fucking repressed. And I've tried to help my friends with that before, and most of them have passed away because they were so afraid of their anger. I'm not. I have a lot of things to learn, my friends. And I hope to grow a lot more before I shuffle off this mortal coil, but I will tell you this. Zach was right. My anger is a gift. And if you don't like me, and if you don't like that, Maybe it's time to spend a few more minutes in front of your own mirror and wrestling with your own darkness before you come and sit down at my table. Smoke that over, son. Mm -hmm.